Thank you, Joshua. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and then we will um, throw it out to everyone. I think I want to ask you first um, how you found or became involved or decided to tell this story through Romley's family. Well, I began my all of my work in Indonesia helping a community of plantation workers to make a film documenting their struggle to organize a union in the immediate aftermath of the Suharto dictatorship in 2001, 2002. And the workers, it turned out, I went, it was a six month project, I had no idea that it would, t at that time, that it would evolve into something so long and in, uh, but when I arrived, I found that very terrible conditions, women dying because of herbicides that they had to spray with no protective clothing, and everybody too afraid to do much about it because, or everybody too afraid to really come together and organize a union because their parents and grandparents, all of the workers' parents and grandparents had been in a strong plantation workers' union had been accused of being communist sympathizers in 1965 simply for being in a union and had been killed or put for decades in concentration camps. And the plantation workers were afraid this could happen to them again. And so what I understood was killing these women who were dying of liver disease from this, from this pesticide, from this herbicide, was not just poison but also fear. Because when they, and when they would so much as uh, even deliver a petition to the company saying they wanted protective clothing, the company would hire thugs, the same organization you see in the act, you, if you see the act of killing that's at the center of that film, to attack them and beat them up, to threaten them. And so people were, these women were dying because of fear, and that left a very big impression on me back in my 20s when I started this. And these. After we finished that film, they said, come back and let's make another film together about why we are afraid, about what it's like for us to live with the perpetrators all around us. Well, now understanding that these friends that I'd spent six months working with were actually survivors of a genocide and unable to turn away and just return to what I was doing before I had gone to Indonesia six months earlier, I, I stayed or I went promptly back and began working with the survivors in that region to start telling, trying to tell this story, and found right away that there was one name in particular on the plantation and across that whole plantation region that was virtually synonymous with the whole genocide, one victim whose name was virtually synonymous with the genocide, and that was Romley. Because Romley's murder had witnesses. Everybody else had been dispatched in the dead of night from concentration camps to be killed on the banks of rivers, and then their bodies uh, thrown into the rivers to drift out to sea, never to be heard from again. Rom, people saw Romley being murdered. He, they saw he had gotten back to the house. They'd seen him begging for help at one point, and then they found his body in the plantation. So to speak about Romley for the survivors on the plantations was to somehow insist that these events had really happened. Here you had a whole community that had been traumatized and unable to talk even about the events that had traumatized them. They'd been traumatized by this and threatened by the government to pretend as though nothing had happened, or to, to act as though nothing had happened. And so to speak about Romney was somehow to insist that this had really happened, that there would, and to insist therefore on their own sanity, were traumatized for a reason. And so very quickly when I started the work with the survivors, I was introduced to Romley's family. I immediately, this was back in 2000, early 2003, I immediately fell in love with Rohani, Romley's mother, Rukun, Romley's father. And then shortly after I met the parents, I met Adi, who turned out was no longer living in the village, but in the city of Medan, about 60 miles away. And Adi was born after the genocide and consequently wasn't wasn't traumatized in the same way. He hadn't witnessed these events, but he definitely was affected by having grown up in a family that was so afraid. He was, in fact, eager to understand what had happened that had made his family so afraid. 
so afraid, in fact, that they wouldn't even talk to him about what had happened. He wanted to understand why his family was so afraid, why his community was so afraid, and what had happened to his country. And he latched on to my filmmaking process, which was in its very early stages then, as a vehicle, I think, for answering those fundamental questions. And actually, just something you just said, that, that, that Adi was born after that, makes me think that, that people who were born after the genocide, how did they even know about it? I'm sure it wasn't taught in the schools, or was it just taught vis-a-vis -vis how bad the communists were? I think it really varies how people understand the, 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 in Indonesia what, and what people know. I think people, because people would talk about Romney, and to be sure because the neighbors of the survivors were often perpetrators who, as you see in, in the act of killing, and you see here, boast about what they've done, they, I think, would also boast in front of their neighbors as well. So I think you have a government that's threatened everybody into silence. You have neighbors who are nevertheless boasting of the atrocities. Not, not um, maybe boasting's the wrong word, maybe talking about them in a frightening way in order to assert their power and to keep people afraid. And somehow I have this feeling that if you imagine that I had this feeling that the government encouraged the actual executioners, the people who needed to talk about the atrocities because those were the single most traumatic and enormous events in those people's lives. They encouraged them to go back and boast so that they would become kind of feared proxies of the state, feared proxies of the government, and people would be afraid. So I think, at least in North Sumatra, especially as perpetrators were constantly being honored in the media and in the power structure there, and they were rising to the rank of governor and rising to the re rising through the ranks of the provincial power structure. I think everybody, in, people in North Sumatra generally know about the genocide. The, in other parts of Indonesia, I think people sometimes merely sense that something is terribly, terribly wrong. Or before, at least, there, a national conversation began about the genocide over the past couple years, in part, because of my previous film, The Act of Killing. But I think there was either a sense that something's very, very wrong, or a sense that the curriculum as it's taught in school, the anti-communist propaganda that's taught to justify the killings, that that must be a lie. Um, so there's a suspicion that there's something there, or there's real knowledge about it, and it varies. Um, so many things to get to, and, and we will get to questions of the audience. I, I, I think, though, I want to just ask about um, sort of the making of this film, and also, you know, can't help but also talk about the act of killing, um, and in, in a sense, which came first? I mean, you have people boasting in both films, in, but in the act of killing, I don't know how many people here may have seen it, I mean, they're literally, they're, they're are sets, they are, they're being like Hollywood stars, and, and, and being stars of their own massacre that they've done. Uh, here, it's simply different. They're simply relating it to you in a, in a, in a very sort of matter-of-fact, boastful, but matter-of-fact way. Um, how did you, almost how did you decide to make both films? I'm not sure my question is going to come out correctly. But you, you know what I mean? Of all, all these things that you see were happening, you decide to go and, and investigate this. And how did you happen to make this film this way and sort of make the act of killing that way? Yeah. Well, there's a scene in this film that is the genesis of both films, and it's the scene where the two men take me down to the river and show how they kill, taking turns, playing victim and perpetrator, posing for pictures at the end. That, that was a pleasant after, or appeared to be a pleasant afternoon for those two men, but for me it was one of the most harrowing afternoons of my life, and I was pretty traumatized by the end of it. Um, I had this feeling that really sunk in that afternoon that that the it, it's as though I've wandered into Germany 40 years after the Holocaust only to find the Nazis still in power. It was that afternoon that I sort of came to that sense that what's going on here, which is so terrible, isn't the atrocities in 1965, but the ongoing impunity, the, the power of these men today. That And I knew at that time that I would give as many years of my life as it would take to make, to address this situation, and I knew there would be two films. I knew that one film would deal with what happens when killers win, when they 
take power, re remain in power, and therefore are able to create a victor's history justifying their actions and impose that history on an entire society. What does that do to the society? What moral vacuum does that lead to? What does it do to the humanity of the men who've done the killing? What does it do to everybody's? To, to, what does it do to the community? And that film inevitably became one about escapism and fantasy and storytelling and guilt. And that's, of course, the act of killing. And I knew there would be another film equally about today, equally about the present-day legacy of these atrocities, which would be somehow about what does it mean for survivors to have to continue to live in the shadow of the men who've killed their relatives. I, the, the, in terms of the material you see with the perpetrators in this film, it, all of it, all of the old material that Adi's watching was shot from 2003 to 2005, before I met Anwar Congo. And you see when I, and then the bulk of the film was shot in 2012, after we finished editing The Act of Killing, but before we released it, at which point I knew that I wouldn't be able to safely return to Indonesia. Um, I, when I, was working with the survivors at the beginning. Very quickly, I, I, I met. I said that I met Adi back in 2003, and he'd really latched on to the, my filmmaking process and became a real traveling companion through it. But very quickly, the army threatened all the survivors not to participate in the film anymore. The survivors then said, "Continue to film. Don't don't go home. Don't quit. Try to film the perpetrators. See if they'll tell you what they did." And I was afraid to approach the perpetrators at first, but when I did, I found to my horror, really, that all of them were immediately open and boastful. And when the survivors, when the human rights community in Indonesia, and when Adi saw that, they all said, keep filming the perpetrators. Because no one, you're, you're finding out what happened. And Adi, though, said something additionally, which was so important, which was, keep filming the perpetrators because anybody who sees this anyone who sees the way they're speaking, who hears the way they're speaking, will be forced to acknowledge that there's something terribly wrong here today. They'll know just by the way they're talking that there's something terribly wrong. And so feeling entrusted by the survivors, by Adi, by his family, and by the broader human rights community, I spent two years filming every perpetrator I could find. And these kind of straightforward reenactments that you see in this film, similar to what, if you've seen The Act of Killing, Anwar does the first day I meet him. Anwar Congo, the main character of The Act of Killing, does the first day I meet him, which is to take me to a rooftop and show how he killed with wire. Mm. This was the sort of thing I was filming for two years. And Adi would watch everything we had time to show him with this mixture of curiosity, <coughs> devastation, anger. And finally, I met Anwar, he was the 41st perpetrator I filmed at the end of that two-year period. I then spent five years filming The Act of Killing with Anwar, and all through that process, Adi would watch everything we had time to show him. When I finished editing The Act of Killing, and it was time to go back and shoot what became The Look of Silence, I knew I would begin that journey with Adi, and Adi then said, Josh, I need to go meet these perpetrators. And I said immediately, absolutely not, because I couldn't think of any way of making it safe. Why do you want to do that, I asked him. And he said, because I'm hoping that they will somehow be able, when they meet me, the brother of their victim, they'll be forced to acknowledge that they killed human beings, and they'll therefore be forced to acknowledge that what they did was wrong. And therefore, hopefully, I will be able to if they can acknowledge it's wrong, I'll be able to separate the human being from the crime and forgive the human being. And if I can forgive the human being, then, there's, then, I, then we can start to live side by side as human beings, instead of side by side as perpetrator and victim, with us constantly afraid of them. So he wanted to meet them to forgive them. And I felt that that was so dignified and preposterous and honorable, that I should think very hard if there's any way we could do this safely. And I realized because we'd shot The Act of Killing, and because the production of The Act of Killing was something of a news story across North Sumatra, and 
because they hadn't yet seen the act of killing the perpetrators, I realized they thought I was close to the vice president of Indonesia, the head of the police, the head of the, the, the governor of the province, the nat national head of their paramilitary or organization. And I thought, they would, I realized they would think two or three times before they would attack us physically. And if we could shoot those meetings in rapid succession, working our way up from the lower ranks to the higher ranks, and if we were prepared to evacuate, and if the family really had a chance to talk about what might be the consequences of releasing this film that they might have to move, if all of that was in place, then we could perhaps shoot this film safely, and that ultimately is what happened. Okay, let's um, see if there are any questions here. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the news piece was totally mystifying to me because it begins kind of upbeat. These are victories against communism, and then at the end it's all about killing people, and I couldn't figure out if the point of view of the piece was this is a good thing or is it a bad thing because it had two different tones. So my first question is, what is your take on that news piece? And more generally, what was the tone of U.S. news media at the time, which you must have researched? You're talking about that NBC. Yes. That NBC, I think, yeah. So did everybody hear that? The question is from the, that NBC news piece in the 60s. Yeah, what do you see as the U.S. take on it? Well, I see the news piece as, I, I see that the news piece is, you're absolutely right to be mystified. The news piece is doing the impossible, which is trying to present mass murder as good news, which was the editorial position of most of the, all of the U.S. mainstream media. So the New York Times and Time Magazine published such headlines as a gleam of light in Asia and the West's best news for years in Asia. And the, there's no critical response when the executioner from Bali says, uh, when Dr. Rada is his name, when he says, now Bali's more beautiful without communists. Um, there's no follow-up question. And then we're presented with a little story about Indonesia's potential, uh, econo economic potential, and we hear that one of the bright spots is that Goodyear, mm -hmm. the world's lo one of the world's largest tire and rubber companies, is using slaves to harvest its rubber, and then dispatching those slaves from concentration camps to be killed, much as German companies did around the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp. This is a pretty dark stain. I just want to pause there, because that's a pretty dark stain on the United States' record as a force for freedom and democracy in the post-war world that 20 years after Auschwitz, American corporations were doing the same thing in Sumatra. Here, we're going to try to get to everybody in a blue shirt, yeah. Um, hi, I'm from uh, Jakarta, Indonesia. Uh, so, um, I, just want to, I was just wondering, given the sort of recent political climate in Indonesia with the election of President Joko Widodo and also recent legislative problems, um, do you think there's any chance of an official recognition on the part of the government in terms of uh, what happened in 1965? Do you think there's any chance now for any official recognition by the government of what happened? I, I'm hopeful, but I think it's up to Indonesians to build, an, build a progressive base for the new president so that he has some reason, some ability, some, some ability, some, some leverage actually do what I think he wants to do, which is to recognize these crimes. Uh, just to give everybody else some background here, in July, Indonesia elected a new president, and it was a narrow victory of the first, of Joko Widodo, who's the first Indonesian president um, since, the, since the Suharto dictatorship, neither to come from the elite, nor to be an oligarch, nor to be, who, who's become wealthy entirely through plunder and criminality, nor to be a high-ranking military officer with, a, with connections to human rights abuse. And he beat narrowly someone who is really a war criminal, um, a, a man named Prabowo Supianto. And yet, the only way you can succeed in Indonesian politics, as in, the, as in American politics, is with the backing of tremendous wealth. 
and therefore he has had to surround himself with thugs and criminals, just as you can't become president here without the backing of some pretty unsavory people. And so he has chosen this, is if any of you have seen The Act of Killing, there's a vice president who appears in The Act of Killing who says, we need our gangsters to be able to get things done, to be able to beat people up so we can get things done. And uh, Joko Widodo chose that vice president to be his running mate in this new presidential election, and he has as the head of one of the leaders of his transition team, a man named Hendro Priono, who's presumably, well, who's responsible for a massacre in South Sumatra in Lampung, and is most certainly responsible for the murder of a friend of mine, the human rights activist Munir, uh, who was murdered about a decade ago. The, the point is not that Joko Widodo is just like those criminals who surround him. The point is that Joko, until Indonesians can overcome the fear that underpins, that actually is the true source of apathy, to organize a, an alternative progressive base for this president, the president's going to have a lot of trouble implementing any prog progressive policies. I think, so I think it's really incumbent on Indonesians to now support him in doing what I think he wants to do. He has said he wants to recognize past human rights violations. I'm hopeful that, with, that, the, that the act of killing sort of, the act of killing, the la my last film, helped catalyze, I think, a transformation in how the media talks about the genocide. There was an editorial in the Jakarta Post this morning talking about the genocide as a genocide, not arguing for that, just describing it, just as a, labeling it, the Indonesian genocide. That was unthinkable, I think, a few years ago, before the act of killing. The country now is able to talk about this as a genocide when the act of killing was nominated for an Academy Award. The government finally acknowledged that what happened in 1965 was a crime against humanity, but they didn't do so in a good way. They didn't say we need to do something about this. They said we will do something about this, but we don't need a film to make us do something about this. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, it was wonderful because it was the first time they've ever said anything other than that the mass murder was heroic. So finally, there's a space opened, and I hope now this film will come in and show Indonesians like yourself how urgently needed, first of all, truth, reconciliation, and healing actually is. And second of all, through the dignified example of Adi, and through the dignified example of the daughter of the perpetrator, who finds the grace, really, and the humanity to apologize on her father's behalf, through those two examples, I hope this film provides a model and an inspiration for how truth and reconciliation could actually be within our grasp. Oh my goodness, all right. Um, all the way in the back, the last row, yes, in the white shirt. I just want to know if you could give an update on Adi. Yeah. Yeah. An update on Adi. So, for the last six months, we've worked really closely with Adi's family to secure their safety. Adi was with me at the Venice Film Festival and the Telluride Film Festival and the Toronto Film Festival last, just a few weeks ago, at <coughs> premiering this film, the first screenings of this film. Uh, we worked though, over the last six months to find, to, to relocate the family to another part of Indonesia, thousands of kilometers from where we made the act of killing and the look of silence, um, away from the men who are most offended by my work and away from the men who've done this to Adi's family. The, it's a terrible thing, of course, that the family has to relocate especially given that what Adi is seeking from those confrontations is actually to be able to forgive people. Instead, he has to run away like a fugitive. The fact that that, that injustice, that unfairness, speaks volumes to how far Indonesia still has to come before it can really live up to the name, uh, live up to the, uh, really become the democracy that it claims to be. That said, we've tried to make the very best out of a very bad situation, which is to, involves getting the children into much better schools, getting the family out from under the shadow of the men who actually did this to them, out of the, away from the isolation of North Sumatra, and into a much more supportive community of filmmakers, critical journalists, human rights activists, all the people who helped 
make these two films possible. So, and of course, though, if anything, of course, though, there's also a plan B. Uh, everybody in the family has visas and are able to leave Indonesia at a moment's notice to join us in Europe, where, where I live. So there's, there's, so I, we, we're pretty confident that the family's safe, Adi's safe, everyone's doing well, but it's a terrible thing that the family should have to move for this. Um, you know, and looking at this film and thinking about Long Night's journey and today, and the effect of the Truth and Reconciliation trials on the mothers in particular, and then seeing in your film that that's not possible yet because for the reasons you've given, just wondered about the role of memory as a survival tool, repress memory as a survival tool. What happened to some of these subjects when you actually did confront them, whether they responded on camera or not, you did confront the memory, the lie, and on both sides. Do you know anything about the daughter is, to me, the most powerful scene in the film. It's, it's small and it's a subtle scene. But what do you think you've accomplished, not with us, but, but with those people that you actually filmed? So, it's, it, what have you accomplished? But it, it really, question also about memory of, 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 of memory. digging into their memories, and, and what do you think you may be accomplished with them? Well, I see the film first of all as a poem, not just to the necessity of breaking silence, mm -hmm. but also to the trauma that inevitably attends breaking silence. Mm -hmm. There's a moment in the film that means so much to me that I think is uh, really somehow I, I hope honest, where. Adi, after, after, when he's talking to his mother, and, and he tells his mother what he found out about his uncle, about her brother, and she insists that she didn't know. Yes. And first, I think there's a sense of doubt. Yeah. Maybe you knew, but you couldn't bear knowing. Mm -hmm. So you had to deny it to yourself. And she keeps insisting. So there's something there about survival and denial. Denial mm -hmm. is survival mm -hmm. strategy. And then, I think... He start, there starts to be this look of doubt on his face, like, perhaps I shouldn't have told my mother this. Mm -hmm. Now, I know, because I, of course, am in, we're all in touch, uh, I'm in touch with Rohani very regularly, I know that she was pained by that discussion. I also know that the scene that we shot not long after that, when Kamat comes to the door and she cries. I also know that was the first time she'd cried since Romley died. And I'd spent years with this family. And she would say again and again, don't you don't think I don't cry. I cry inside. But she never cried outside. And after she cried, she said, I haven't cried since mm -hmm. since Romley died. Mm -hmm. I don't say that's necessarily healing or cathartic. And I don't think you can go, I, I don't know, I'm not a psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't presume to argue that this is good for them. That, that I, I don't dare argue that. But I'm not saying it's bad for her. I'm just saying I don't, I don't claim that expertise. And I know that as far as I can see her and understand her, she's okay and was maybe at, more at ease after relieved to have been able to cry. <clears throat> and to go through this journey. I do know, however, that if there's trauma that comes with breaking silence, there's also a terrible danger that comes with the silence. The perpetrators say again and again in the film, if you dig into this, it will happen again. Mm -hmm. And I think what the whole film shows is that in fact, if you don't dig into this, if you don't look at what happened, then the past is never past because we haven't even said what the past is or what it means. And then it can always happen again. And you see the, con you see the ground being laid for it to happen again, not just in the continued power of the perpetrators who are able to threaten and attack us. And we had to take, people would often ask when I would make, uh, regarding the act of killing, were you afraid making that film? And I would say, generally not really. I was emotionally afraid, but not physically afraid. But here we were physically afraid all the time and we had many precautions. We would have a getaway vehicle so that we could leave without being followed. We would have uh, 
I would shoot with only a Danish crew. Normally I shoot with an Indonesian crew, but I would shoot the confrontations with only a Danish crew so that as few people as possible would be at risk. I would have the, the whole family packed and at the airport, and my, the rest of my crew packed and at the airport ready to evacuate. Uh, we would have no, Adi would go with no ID uh, in case, so that if we were detained, they wouldn't be able to figure out who he was, at least not before hopefully we could get help from our embassies. So we were afraid. So there's that sense that repetition, obviously, if this isn't talked about, there's the threat of repetition because those men are still powerful. And indeed, anyone who's familiar with Indonesian history will know that, in fact, the killings were repeated again and again and again. I alluded to a massacre of a village a few minutes ago in South Sumatra in a place called Lampung. I, but of course, we all, many of us will be familiar with the invasion and occupation of East Timor, which was a kind of extension of the 1965 genocide and led to one third of the population there dying or being killed. So. There's that. And then, of course, we see the groundwork for what I was, the groundwork for repetition being laid in, the, in Iqbal's, in Adi's son's school, where the children are being brainwashed to hate. They're being brainwashed to hate. So, in terms of the daughter, you also asked about her. Adi maintained a kind of friendship with her. I don't think that uh, he spent much time around the dad he'd visit the house and they'd talk outside and I stayed in touch with her for some time on the phone. I lost touch with her when her phone, when she changed her number and I was no longer able to go back to Indonesia and visit her but Adi, Adi remained in touch with her and would visit her until around the same time which was when he moved from North Sumatra. Thank you. Uh, uh, right here. Yeah. Um, a lot of the uh, dialogues are shot in separation, in singles, which to me, you know, makes me very aware of the cinematic apparatus. Where did that choice come from? You're talking about your, your cinematic choices, really, in terms of... Yeah, the question dialogues. was why, the, why I'm shooting in close-ups and yeah. how that, well, why I'm shooting in singles and, and how that made you aware of the cinematic apparatus. Um, First of all, I think it, this is a film that really is in some ways about the face and about the look and about, and, and that can only be, have the potency that it has in close-up. So when you're talking about filming scenes in close-up, if you're filming a dialogue, unless you put two people right next to each other, you can't <laughs> film, have the scene in close-up and in, uh, and in, and in a two-shot where you have the two characters in the shot at the same time. And I think one of the things that was very important to me was that we're focusing as much or more on the reactions to the words than we are on the words themselves. Very often in uh, nonfiction film, dialogue follows the words. And I, yet I think cinema is a particularly poor medium for words. Cinema is a medium for silence, for doubt, for subtext, for the uneasy look in response to something someone else says, or the flicker on someone's face, in someone's eyes, after they say something they don't quite believe, but after they say it. And that meant that wherever possible in those scenes we would shoot with two cameras so that we could capture that easily, but with the two most powerful perpetrators we didn't dare shoot with two cameras because we thought the extra five minutes it would take to break down the second camera if we needed to leave in a hurry, could be the difference between safety and danger, and that was made the editing process for those uh, two scenes much more difficult, because we had to really, what all you can really do is capture the beginning of the sentence in sync, and then with the sync sound, looking at the person who's talking, pan quickly the camera to get the reaction, and usually so that you can cut out the pan, you have to just compress slightly the words to save the time of the pan. But that's a that's a very labor intensive way to edit a, edit a scene. Okay, well, um, yeah, in the back. Yeah. And linked to that question, I'm very much interested in uh, what, what's your view on your posi your position as a filmmaker. You have the power. You have the camera. You are the editing. Uh, what what's your moral compass and ethic in regards to what you decide to show or not show? say, in the why, in the how, 
Yeah, so talk about, yeah, you're, as the filmmaker with the power with the camera, your moral position and compass. Because you are like, you are kind of a foreign body. I mean, you compare them to maybe a Rithi Pan that has a similar approach. Well, Rithi Pan can make the films Rithi Pan makes because the Khmer Rouge is out of power. Also, yeah. mm -hmm. And Rithi Pan if he were an Indonesian filmmaker, couldn't safely make these films. No, 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 I, I, don't, I don't take it as an accusation, don't worry. Um, but it comes to my, the question of where my, my position is. I think that, sort of, I sort of glossed over this earlier, but I was describing essentially in the narrative of how this came to be, a sense that I felt like I was on a mission entrusted by, in fact asked by, by Adi's family, by a community of survivors around Adi's family, and by the uh, much of the Indonesian human rights community it, uh, beyond, uh, beyond that, to do this work. Not just this film, but the two films. Kind of, and I took that as seriously as I could. I dropped all the other projects that I had. I stopped everything I did, I was doing, and from the time I filmed that scene that I described as the genesis of this, the two men going down to the river in January 2004, until now, ten and a half years later, I've done nothing else with my life. It wasn't like it took a long time because I was doing other jobs. This is all I've been doing. Maybe it shows that I'm not that prolific or clever, but that's all I was able to do in that time. So I, but because of that, I didn't see myself, and I still don't see myself, as a foreign filmmaker coming in to make a film to expose this to the world. And the impact that I'm following, the critical debate that I'm following around these two films, that I, the one that I really follow closely, is the debate inside Indonesia. Because I felt like I was entrusted by people who's, who couldn't do this themselves, to do something that would was urgently needed there. And I did it in a way by presuming that they are like me, that I am like them, that I that 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 my audience, first of all, is going to be someone like myself, not necessarily foreign, Indonesians like myself, people who have different knowledge, but whose humanity and whose what moves them, what makes them laugh when there's humor, what makes them upset or anxious when there's something to be upset or anxious about is the same as what makes me upset or anxious or makes